Hey, yo, Ryan, you are one of my best friends. You have been in my life for how many years? Uh, four or five, anyway. Yeah, mm-hmm. not that many. Uh, so we met on Glad, I believe. Yeah. I knew that your the quality of your work would definitely elevate my game. Ah. The the quality was unquestionable. Uh-huh. And um so what was your impression of being a the a blabber. <laughs> it, it seems a little odd for me to use that terminology a blabber. Mm-hmm. Well, well, it you know, being a blabber was was probably the first time because I am an introvert and I don't go, I don't have many friends. I don't go um, and hang out at people's houses and party. I don't drink, um, you know, I'm plant-based. So I, I kind of keep to myself a lot. And when we were in that community, it's the first time where I could be around people and talk to people and not be, and not be, uh, with people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't have to be in your house and I didn't have to hang out with you. Didn't have to like cook you dinner or whatever. And it's not that I'm antisocial. It's just that, you know, it, it, for introverts, we, are quite, um, you know, we, we protect our energy, you know, and that, that's the, the most important thing is like, um, like I can be around people, but I, I just prefer to be in my own space. Um, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of, um, I'm proud of, of being able to just identify that and to let people know what I am so that they're not being, you know, they don't feel like, Oh, Ryan's not talking to me they, today and he's upset with me. No. Um, but being an introvert and being on blab um, was, you know, essentially the most important, it was like a really good thing. And and we were all coming into spaces and learning new things and being able to explore people. Cause I don't, I don't think you and I would have been friends if it hadn't it not been for blab. Right. I don't think that, um, you know, I don't think that people would have been, um, I wouldn't, I don't think like you and I would have like even, even talked and it's not because of who we are as individuals. I just, we're not, we, you're in Kelowna, I'm in Calgary. Um, you know, and I don't think because of Facebook's, you know, and, and LinkedIn, you don't just fall into somebody, you know, uh, by, you know, with, through social media, you, you have to meet someone through someone in order to meet people like yourself. So, you know, Blab was, was a moment in time. Um, and now they have a new app called Clubhouse. If you have an iPhone, you can participate now and it's all voice, but it has the same impact, same effect where people can meet each other and um, be able to, you know, have these conversations. The thing I liked about Blab was it expanded my reach. I I am the complete opposite to you. Mm-hmm. I am an extrovert. <laughs> I know this. <laughs> I know this for sure. Like I flew in the gallery to meet you. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty awesome. That was actually, and Waitsi was there with me at the time. Remember Waitsi? I took you out to lunch or dinner. Yeah, you took us to, to your favorite, favorite restaurant, the keg. It was incredible. Yeah. Oh my God. I really enjoyed that. It was that unique experience. Oh yeah, most definitely. And it was nice nice to meet you in person. I didn't realize you were I didn't realize you were tall. Uh, how short did you did you think I was? I don't know. I never met you in real life, right? So uh when oh. you came, I, I didn't realize that you were you were you were tall. Like, you know, and it it's just 
but either way, like it was, it was fantastic because we only met on Blab and then, you know, for us to become friends and to be in each other's lives for this long and to have such an impact on each other's lives. Um, um, you've, had, you've had a lot of impact on my life. No, my, my big, my big push in, in this, uh, virtual summit is all about how how we how our how we serve the challenge burden. Tell me about your challenges. Well, okay. So let me just I was just gonna I'm just putting this on my social just uh one second I'm gonna cancel. I just wanted to just show people that I'm doing something with you but the um um my my challenge or challenges is that like i first first and foremost i was born born out of wedlock um i was a product of rape and it's hard oh I, it, it was hard to um it was hard to uh it's hard to say but you know it you know this is something my mom went through she had postpartum depression. Um, she was quite, um, you know, like when you have postpartum depression, especially with children, um, you know, there, there, are, there could be complications, right? And we've had a very complicated relationship and it was, um, you know, abusive at times, but I kind of grew up being a child that didn't belong anywhere because everybody knew I was a kid outside of the marriage. And my biological father lived in, um, you know, lived in uh, Guyana. So, you know, that was one of my challenges. One of the biggest challenges was the relationship between my mother and I. She was quite, a, quite abusive towards me um, when we were growing up. And mainly because I look like her, the, the guy that raped her. So, um, mm. you know, and it, it and the... And it's, it's, it's sad because like I met him in 2000, she allowed me to go and meet him and, you know, and I knew the story, but I didn't believe, you know, because of the, the relationship that my mom and I had, I didn't really believe her. Um, and I didn't, you know, because I, like a lot of my parents, they lied to me about my, you know, who my real dad was and, and, and stuff. So, and I walked around just feeling like I was, um, like I was nobody, you know, like I felt like when I read the, the, mm. the story of the ugly duckling, I felt like I was the ugly duckling in the family. And I always would sit in the, my bed and be like, what if my family's not my real family? And, you know, it's so funny. It, what, you know, when I was 17 years old, that's when I found out my dad wasn't my real dad. And I had to go onto this journey trying to find him, you know, to locate him, had to, you know, found out that I had, you know, six other brothers and sisters or six or seven other brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. oh and, um, and, oh. you know, I realized that was a whole family that I never met. And um, so it took oh. me like 10 years to kind of figure that all out. So not only was I getting abused at home, because like my mom would just like smash, like, you know, during that time, she would smash my, um, um, you know, my room apart. If it was messy, I would come home and my, my stuff would be everywhere and I'd have to clean it up. Um, and other things like she would hit me and, 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 and oh, whatnot. And yeah. I kind of lived probably the good, good 35 and I'm 37, 35 years of my life in PTSD. Um, and not knowing I was because like, I've had to work through it, you know, through the last couple of years, kind of work through, um, all of my trauma, but, you know, and then on top of that, I had dyslexia. So I go to school and fail miserably in all of my classes because no one understood that I had dyslexia and then had, had passed that down um, from my mom's side, you know, but on my dad's side, because I, when I met him, I realized he's hyper intelligent. He's hyper, hyper, hyper intelligent. So I got his intelligence, but I have dyslexia. So when you, you mix those two, you get a brilliant person that can't speak <laughs> because uh, uh, dyslexia is a language processing disorder. So what I see in my head is not necessarily what I communicate. 
because what I see in my head is much more intricate than, you know, than my expression. And, mm-hmm. you know, lang- a language processing disorder it does not limit itself to what you see when you're reading a book. Language processing disorder is essentially saying, hey, I cannot take in information, li- linear information, because language to me is a linear linear information because it's only sound and words and you're going through your head and you have to process that into you have to process that into something dyslexics we process imagery we process pictures we process concepts and patterns so um being able to articulate that as a child i couldn't that's why i failed i knew i was smart i knew i could do things um so you know i was the class clown you know, be kicked out of the classroom um, a lot. Um, teachers wouldn't pick my hand, mm-hmm. you know, and when I would explain things, I couldn't explain it. Um, I did pretty bad in school. I did very well in art because I was a visual person, visual student. Um, and um, and I got bullied. I got bullied for the color of my skin. And that's another challenge. You know, it was black in a, in a white neighborhood, night white school. Um, one of the only black kids in the school uh, mm-hmm. let alone being, you know what I mean? So everyone knowing that you're, you're black and, you know, knowing that I'm not the smartest, uh, not the smartest, but like having dyslexia. One thing about dyslexics mm-hmm. is like, we need to organize information. We, we need to like, it's like, I didn't know anything about sorting. So I was a messy kid. My desk was messy. My bags were messy, had like, you know, I didn't know how to clean it out you know, and it was just a problem and people would get upset with me and I didn't know what to do. So my teachers, you know, I know they don't do this now, but my teachers would dump my desk in front of the whole class and everybody would always be laughing at me. Um, you know, people would go in through my bags and stuff and they would make fun of me. Boy. You know, no one would invite me to their, like, you know, to their, their, their house, uh, you know, for birthday parties. So it was quite singled out. My mom, she raised three children on her own majority of the time. Um, you know, like, cause my birth broke up my parents' marriage. So it was like the, you know, I would only see my, you know, I, I would only see my, my father for maybe like, you know, a little bit of time, but my mom was taking care of, uh, all of us on a minimum wage budget, $5 and 90 cents. So, you can imagine I didn't go to school, didn't have the right stuff. I would have asthma attacks. My grandma had to come pick me up and buy medication and all this other stuff. So it was it was pretty treacherous, um, you know, time as a child. And then I got into my teenage years and, you know, started to get into, you know, things that I shouldn't have gotten into. I, at 15, you know, I really started to act out and I became a bully. I became... Um, you know, I became, uh, like I want to be a thug and I, um, you know, and then I was with my friend, we would get into a lot of trouble, um, hanging out with some gangs and, and, and whatnot. And this is when I was like, one of my first experiences, even like with violence, like was going to a club, an after hours club at 15 years old and seeing a machete fight and a guy got stabbed. We watched the guy. I watched the guy get stabbed. And that's my first experience Mm -hmm. as a child, watching a guy get stabbed in front of me and at this, at this nightclub. Um, so, and I was scared because when you, it was an, it was an after hours club. So no one was checking IDs or anything like that. And people were smoking weed and all this other stuff. And so, I was being exposed to that. And at the time I wanted to be a gangster. I wanted to be a rapper. I wanted to be Mm -hmm. all this other stuff because I didn't have any other, I didn't have any other hope. Wasn't doing well in school. You know, I didn't really care about life. And, you know, and then as I got older, figured out that my dad's not my real dad. So I had a lot of anger. Right. So, um, um, but (laughs) There's the silver lining because, um, you know, I had done some things that had gotten me some attention with the police um, when I was a kid. No kidding. Yeah. So I got in trouble and um, and my dad, you know, he's not my biological father, but he started a group 
um, and it was called ACUFA, the African Caribbean United Foundation of Alberta. There was a man that was accused of burning a kid in school. I knew the guy. Um, his name was uh, Jean Favre. Uh, he was a teacher. And he started him, my dad, and a, a few elders in the community, including my dad, um, you know, started an organization to help um, to help him raise funds so, so that we could go to court for the guy. And I was brought there against my will, but I had to go with my father because, you know, like I was a teenager at the time and I was skipping school. I dropped out of school. I think I dropped out of school several times um, in high school, like, cause I didn't really care, wanted to be an entrepreneur and, and whatnot. So, um, and I sat in the room and they're like, Ryan, tell me your problems, you know, and I told them my problems. I told them my problems because I was being singled out by the police. Like I'd be walking home and the police would stop me. And if I was in a hoodie, I would be stopped for no reason. Like the police were wa watching me because they knew some of the people that I hung out with were, were no good. And, you know, and I was telling them about, about my experiences. So they said to me, they're like, hey, you know, like we're going to help you. We're going to help you with some of your stuff. And in some of the, the cases that I had, those cases that I was dealing with with the police as a young offender, um, they said that they would help me with those. So I was very skeptical at first of who these people were and why they were interested in me. It kind of felt weird because they're not cool. I was cool. And I like, uh, I had my hat down like this and I was like, I had an attitude and all this other stuff. And, um, you know, but they helped me, they helped me go through that process. And they got me into black history studies to learn mm -hmm. about my people and learn about my people even beyond slavery, but like in Africa, how some of our people were kings and queens, so on and so forth. So I started to learn a bunch of pride. They started to see something in me that I didn't see in myself at the time. They said, Ryan, you're going to be a leader one of these days. Ryan, you're, you're, you're destined for greatness. Ryan, they start pumping me up with all kinds of, uh, they, they start pumping me up with all kinds of, oh my God. of positivity Great. and they turned me into, and then I met a guy by the name of uh, Gary Martin, who was a ex-military cop. He was a martial artist and he was a musician. He's one of the best musicians in the world. He's a master bluesman. His um, uncle is Hubert Sumlin, for those who follow blues and jazz and whatnot. So he he comes from a long line of, of blues and jazz royalty. He's also part of Motown and all these other things. And um, he, I saw him talking at one of the meetings because now I'm a youth advocate. I'm a guy that wants to help the youth and want to educate people to get off the street. And he's like, young man, I want you to come to my martial arts school. And once I came through his martial arts school, he told me he met Michael Jackson and all these things. And I was like, whoa, I'm like, I want to be like you. So through his mentorship, he became my mentor, him and his wife, Ann Fitz became my mentors and pretty much became my surrogate mother and father, taught me how to read, taught me how to write, taught me how to put programs together, taught me how to be a public speaker. So I started public speaking at the age of 20, uh, going to schools and then teaching kids through rap, not to do drugs and not to get into crime. So I was on the news, um, you know, and I had, gotten to see a completely different side of my life and I um oh and then I got rewarded of Calgary I was the first black youth to not only be nominated for the for the Calgary Stampede um uh, Western Legacy Award um but I was um yeah because it was a, a, a RCMP that uh, RCMP that um um, nominated me, put my nomination in for award. And I was the first recipient, um, the first group of people, and then the first black person to win the Western Legacy Award oh, um, for my contributions to how to for youth, right? So my whole life changed by 
just having people actually cared about me. And it's so funny. My parents didn't care. They didn't, they're like, why are you, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? How come you're hanging out with these people paying your bills? And, and they didn't understand, like they didn't understand. I used to smoke a lot of marijuana and cannabis when I was a kid. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> yes. Yes. I used to smoke a lot. And um, you, that was another challenge is that I had psychosis. I had in, psychosis induced I was, you know, like a, uh, I was mar- cannabis induced psychosis. So I believe that my friends were out to get me. So a part of my transition wasn't just a transition of my mentors coming into my life. I was also scared of my friends. And at the time they all liked me in my visions. They didn't, I was high, highly paranoid, but that was kind of God's grace, you know, just pulling me away from the crowd and, and setting me off to this new plan but I stayed in my house and became even more of an introvert uh, because of the psychosis because I because I wasn't diagnosed with psychosis I didn't go see a a doctor I didn't go see I didn't I didn't see anybody so I thought for a good 20 good 10 years that the visions that I had were real does that make sense so when I met our mutual friend, Waitsi, um, she had explained to me what schizophrenia is and she explained to me what psychosis is. And I was like, oh my God, that's what I experienced. You know, cause that's why I withdrew. Even though I was making changes and going to places, I was scared to go outside of my house. I was scared to like, while I was doing all these good things and these positive things, I was still afraid of my friends. So, um, and I thought it was real. I, I, I started reading books and trying to figure out how I can protect myself um, and, and how to become an entrepreneur. Cause I thought if I made a lot of money, I could stay away from these people and I can run away. Um, you know, and it was all because of visions that weren't real. So when I met my friend, she, when she explained to me what psychosis was um, you know, then it, then I, that's when my healing process started to happen because, you know, being able to unravel a lot of the, oh my god, you know, being able to unravel all the, uh, uh, like all the the falsehoods that my mind would had created when I was in my early twenties, you know, kind of helped me heal because you know my mentors kind of helped me. Like, for example, my sensei Gary, um, they helped me like in terms of. Uh, um, they helped me in terms of being able to just understand the difference between right and wrong. They helped me how, like how to master like graphic design. Like they taught me how to master things and how to become my own man and, and how to, you know, educate other people, how to use my story to help people. But they didn't teach me about the, the inner, they didn't teach me about the psychosis. You know, all they knew is that I was scared they didn't understand why I was scared and I couldn't explain it. I did write a journal through that process and I still have the journal today. And I manifested the person that I would be today. Actually, I put it on my social media. Uh, I manifested, I want to be in a suit. I want to have this. I want to have that. I want to be a father. I'd manifested that during the time I had the psychosis because I was like, I can't, I have to be this person because I don't want to be killed by my friends. So, you know, in a way that story is bittersweet but it helped me, you know, understand the, the way to move forward. And lastly, um, working through my challenges in my thirties, that's where a lot of the stuff happened. Like I had to do with my mom's, you know, the, with the relationship with my mom and we're like best friends now because, you know, because, <laughs> you know, it's it funny. Ding. Go on in circles. Mm-hmm. You have to know how, like, because I, I think it could have been anybody. I could have been anybody. I could have been that guy that was upset and would have hurt my mom. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I could have been the uh, guy that would have, you know, took his life. Because I think with oh, all the stuff God. that had happened to me, I think there are times <laughs> where I, I felt I wanted to not live. And I think, and it was real. It was real. It was a real concept because, you know, what else, like nobody wants me. Nobody wants me part of their family. 
Um, even a, a relative the other day said, I never liked you. I never liked your father. I never liked this and that. And this was a close relative of mine. Um, and mm. they said that to me last year. So it's like, you have to understand, you know, Ryan, I could have been a different person. Ryan, how did they feel about you now? They're, well, most of them are proud because you know what? I, my story my life and me changing my life changed their life, you know, and it's That's funny. Incredible. No. The, the birth of my son as well, like, you know, and them see me a father and being able to raise a smart, you know, kid that, you know, is, um, you know, that is doing well in school, like all the stuff that I went through, we broke this, the cycle of abuse. So of course, everybody's super proud. I have, can you tell everybody online where you are now and what you're doing? Sure, well, <laughs> I am a brand strategist. I am a visual storyteller. Um, I call myself the brand savant. I do live stream production and um, I'm a community <clears throat> architect. And what does that mean is that I build spaces for communities to reside. Um, I've created one brand called Hustle Zone TV, which is a micro community uh, that consists of, um, it, is, it is an African-American um, black uh, centered uh, community to you know, bring different cultures together from all over the world. We have a base of nearly 50,000 people um, and it, it's a base of, of just show, like bringing people because like black people are not a monolith. We, some of us are from Africa. Some of us are from, um, you know, uh, uh, sorry, places in Africa. And, and some of us are from Australia. Some of us are, you know, South American and, and so on and so forth. Not every black person, you know, has African roots right? So like the natives in Philippines, the natives in Australia, natives in, in South, uh, South America are all black, right? So it, I created a project to bring all those groups together. And, you know, we're growing every single day. Like I grew um, maybe 3000 people in the last week. Um, oh my so, God, you so, are absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, using the same concepts that I've taught you and, and taught others um, through. So I do web development, I do web app development, but I'm now focusing on building applications that are, you know, for communities, because I believe that brands only happen, <laughs> you know, because community has been such a, you know, such an important thing in my life um, and it shaped me who I am that's how we need to be with our business. We need to look it within our communities to figure out what they want and provide it to them because we know our communities. We just used to talk about demographics and you say, well, you know, he's, you know, the demographics 25 to 35 year old male. It doesn't really give you a very, you know, exclusive um, perspective on who you're dealing with but you know your community, you know what they like, you know what they don't like, you know, you have a better idea. Um, and when you approach things from a community perspective, you build great brands. And I always believe that brands, sorry, my nose is so itchy. Every time I do like interviews, my nose gets itchy, but oh, brand, no. brands, brands live in the, the, uh, hey, no. yeah, no worries. <laughs> I hate phone, especially at this time. Hi, Matt, come on in. Right, okay. Yeah, I feel like brands are, um, Brands are in the ecosphere. They're in the matrix. And it, in, in a brand strategist is someone that pulls that brand out of the matrix and gives Hold it to on. Did that, that brand, bro, do me, do me. Okay. 
No worries. I'm having a delivery. Okay. Sorry so, about that. Sounds good. I'm getting a new light. Okay. Thank you so much, Antoinette. I will update the invoice. Hello, Ryan. Hey. I'm back. I bought a new light. Nice. Not that I really need it, but. Okay, I'm back. So what were you saying? I, I was saying that I believe that we we all live in the matrix, which is a series of numbers. And yeah. you know, we are we live in a matrix and brands great brands live in the matrix and you know it's the job of a brand strategist job of the entrepreneur to kind of discover what like what that brand is i don't think that people create brands i feel like the universe creates the brand you just you are just selected by the universe to um to to bring it to life because once a brand is born um, once a brand is born in someone's mind, it's born in everyone's mind, right? And everyone can have a different point of view of the brand and everyone, and the brand can live in their minds of, of how that is. So, so that's why it's so important for branding. And it's so important to have someone like me in your life, because, you know, we try to protect your brand, we give you messaging and, you know, we develop a community around the brand so that people know and understand you know, what, what it is that you're all about, but they also are benefiting from the experience that you're offering them. So, you know, um, you know, and that's how I built hustle zone. Um, and, you know, and then, and I'm going to do that for other people, for their communities, for their respective businesses, etc. So, um, you know, and, and that's essentially what I do. So I call myself a community architect, brand strategist, and the visual storyteller. The last thing is visual storytelling. I sit down just like similar to you having a meeting with you. And I interview you about your story. I pick it apart, you know, and I try to understand not only your story, but the story of your competitors, the story of your demographic, the story of your community, how you were raised, what sparked the idea of the business. And then I try to try to ask myself, what is the universe trying to tell me about this person? What is the universe trying to tell me about this product? and kind of put together a succinct brand so that everyone can adapt to it and follow it. You know, like look at your background, your background's purple and it's, and it's peach or like beige. Um, and, you know, when we created these concepts, cause I've created, you know, obviously helped you with your branding. Um, you know, this, this background looks so good on you because when I was coming up with colors, I was taking your photos and trying to pick out like, you know, what would be the best color for, 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 um, for Michael, how can we soften his, his, his look and make him look, you know, like make him look like a star, you know, make him look like someone you could trust, you know, it, it, you know, I didn't invent the brand. It, it's the universe telling me, Hey, you know, maybe blue is not the right color because we use blue and the blue was like, I was like in your face, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> but the purple was just, 
what I the found Brooklyn, went well with your complexion. The purple is absolutely beautiful. Thank you very much for the purple or the background. You're welcome. And, but it looks good on you. And, and see, the thing is, is that now people are working with your brand, helping you build your brand. People are interacting with you. I'm interacting with you. And, you know, the brand is, is now developing on its own. You know, you just had to put it out there. But now it's starting to develop into something that is quite bigger than you and I. And, you know, and that's the whole point. The whole point is, you know, to find it within the matrix, nurture it like a child and let it grow on its own. Yeah. I love it. Um, how can people get a hold of you so they can work with you? How can they get a hold of me? They can go to bowtiecreative.com. So B-O-W-T-I-E-K-R-E-A-T-I-V-E.com. Um, or they can find me at I am brand B R A N D savant S A V A N T uh, dot C A. So, or so, no, 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 I am brand savant. That's my Instagram. They can find me through either brand savant or through Hustle Zone TV, or they can buy me at, at Botox Creative, any of those avenues. Yeah, I know that, that you're wearing your bow tie. Yes. Thank you so much. I was on you for not having it. Yes, <laughs> you're like, I need you to wear your bow tie. I love the bow tie. I just don't wear it in the house a lot and it chokes me up. It's like, oh, my name is Ryan Perez and I'm... Uh, I but... never wear a bow tie. <laughs> it's, not, it's not part of my brand. Yeah. <laughs> so with, that, with that, I'm going to wrap me up. You have been an amazing guest. Oh, thank you. Well, I gave you a lot to chew on. I mean, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I've told that story so many times that like, it's like, just comes out like verbiage. It's like, blah, you know, or like verbal diarrhea. Like, it's like, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, it's it, my story and I'm proud of it. It was anything but diarrhea. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for having me on. And, you know, we all, like you said, we all have challenges. Some are more pronounced than others. My challenges are not apparent. You can't, when you look at me, you don't know that those challenges are there. Well, the challenges are there every day. And I have to deal with those challenges every day. I work really hard to make, you know, just to ensure that my son doesn't have to go through my challenges. But I think that, um, you know, you know, for my challenges, I think I can teach a lot of people on how to overcome those things because, you know, dyslexia, I even created a, 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 a TikTok on dyslexia, giving people tools and things that they can do to read because I had to invent, you could you imagine, I even, I, I still haven't been diagnosed with it. I just know dyslexia is passed on to a lot of family members. Um, but I know it's real. Oh, go ahead. Your son has dyslexia? He has dyscalculia. And um, no, what the hell is dyscalculia? Dyscalculia is um, dyslexia, but not being able to process numbers, counting. Uh, I, I can't do that when they come to my bank account. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I hate, I hate doing my. Uh, Rick and Donnie, my bank account. Yeah, it's 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 tough because I have it, he has it, but I gave him some tools that um, I gave him some tools that he can use within his stuff, and <clears throat> it, it's amazing because he got fours on all of his report cards, which is the highest level of well, not fours in all sections, but he's doing really well in math. Is because I sat down and I taught him just from a dyslexic's point of view, you know, instead of showing him numbers, I showed him objects um, and gave the objects meaning, um, you know, not just because, you know, like there are tools to aid, you know, counting, but you have to also put meaning, you know, because we need, like, we need, 
I don't know why my nose is so itchy, but we need, um, we, we need context and we need associations and patterns and stuff. So I taught him in a certain way and then he did really well with his math. So, you know, he, I'm very proud of him and, um, you know, and the fact that he didn't get all of my dyslexia that he, you know, that he can just ride through it. But I, I worked with him because I was so afraid when he was two, taught him how to read when he was two. Like I did a lot of different things just to ensure that he didn't have to go through because like school was very troubling to me. School was a real problem. Yeah, it was a problem for me. And that's why I withdrew, you know, and, and that's why I didn't want to go to school because I, you know, mm. but now, now I look at it and I'm like, it just, I, I still think school sucks. Um, uh, Cause I don't, I think that schools need to, they need to be upgraded. First off, it, school is too long for children. Children have the learning capacity for about three and a half hours, you know, so to be stuck in a school for more than that is bad on their brain. They're already implementing in our district. Um, they're already implementing. Um, they're already implementing uh, no homework. So, you know, for the last mm -hmm. six years, my son didn't have to bring home any homework, which was good. Um, because I know coming home after school doing homework, that also stifles growth. Um, that was horrible. They make the textbooks. The problem with the textbooks is that they don't put it in chronological order. They don't put it one after another. They spread it out through the book. Mm -hmm. They don't want, they want you to find the answers and they kind of do it intentionally. Uh, but for someone like me who wants to learn because I'm intelligent, you know, and I say that people are like, how could you call yourself intelligent? I just know. I just know what I, what my brain needs. And when I want to move ahead of the course, they purposely mix up the textbooks. So you can't go ahead. You know, they put bits and parts in throughout the textbooks. So I think that the school systems need to be upgraded um, to facilitate different learning styles and different, you know, and maybe, maybe we don't have to go to school. Maybe we can create, you know, self-learning studies that, you know, you still need to be around children. You still need to be around your friends, but maybe they, they could cut schools in half. Maybe we don't have to go to school as much. Maybe we, they can play more. Maybe they can explore more, but I feel, I still feel like it's not challenge friendly, but they're getting there. It takes a while for school systems to upgrade and to do the research mm. and implement things. Cause mm. you know, like this is something that's state run, right? But it's, you mm. know, schools are not challenge friendly. Well, at uh, that, uh, this point I'm going to cut it off. Thank you once again. Thank you so much for having me I'm, on. Go I'm going to cut the recording off. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. You're welcome. Uh, have a great day. Okay, thank you. Did I give you enough?